In today's episode, I get to speak with Hannah Nation of the China Partnership. We get to talk about Wang Yi and about the Chinese house church. We discuss government, nonviolence, suffering, and what the American church can learn from the Chinese house church. For those of you who may be interested in particular topics, you can go ahead and see the timestamps in the, in the show notes and jump to whatever portion you're interested in. This episode is meant to complement a number of the other episodes that we've done. We uh, highlighted one of Wang Yi's works earlier in the season, and we've also talked about uh, questioning whether nonviolent resistance for as as good as it is in comparison to war and doing violence to other people, whether that should be our goal as Christians to change government. So this is a part of that larger conversation and something that would probably be helpful uh, to, to hear the rest of those works, which I will also link in the show notes. Also make sure to check the show notes for links to some of the things that uh, Hannah and I think are relevant for this discussion and some of the, the articles that she mentioned particularly the cross in the landfill and when the police come knocking. But there's also one that Hannah forgot to plug and wanted me to make sure that I plug that right now, and that is The Church in the Wilderness. So please make sure you check out the resources in the show notes below. Without further ado, here is our conversation with Hannah Nation. So I, I reached out to you because um, I saw Jeff Kyle at the, uh, at the Gospel Coalition, and Jeff and I go back a ways. I mean, it, we haven't really spent that much time together recently be, since his move to New York, but um, just really have always liked him, and, and he's such a genuine guy. And when I was talking with him about you know, some of the things that I was, I was doing for my podcast and, and such, he told me about uh, about Wang Yi, and so I I uh, ended up kind of searching him and and going to the uh, uh, the China Partnership site, and I I found his My Declaration of Faithful Disobedience, and it fit so well with um, what I was kind of thinking through and struggling with um, in regard to to nonviolence and politics and and action, so. I, I really wanted to include that in the podcast, so I just did a few weeks ago, and you were gracious enough to to let me reproduce that. So thank you. Mm. Um, and then you also you had the added there's the added bonus of you offered to do an interview, which was, I mean, just amazing. So thank you so much for for agreeing to do that. Um, before we get into like the specifics of of the interview, I would like for you to to introduce yourself. And um, tell everyone who you are, and then also, uh, I know that you have a, a book coming out, and I, you know, go ahead and plug that and and tell about that as well. Yeah. Um, well, I'm Hannah Nation. I've uh, served the church in China for uh, a long time now, <laughs> so it's been probably about 15 years since I first got involved. Um, and I currently am involved with um, two different projects, you could say. Um, I'm the content director for an organization called China Partnership. And um, CP works to basically resource and support um, a bunch of house church pastors um, across China. And the um, newer thing I'm involved with, uh, it's just launching this year. So it's pretty exciting. It's called the Center for House Church Theology. And um, basically our, our really our, our vision with the center is to help bring the richness and the depths of the theological wisdom coming out of China um, to the global church. And I think um, all of my work for the last five to seven years has been focused on basically this idea that um, Chinese house church pastors are writing and preaching and theologizing in China's urban context. And um, the time is really right to try to share that with the rest of the world, to share the unique and special ways that they are engaging uh, scripture and knowing and loving Christ and um, sharing that with 
the rest of us who may not um, read Chinese <laughs> or <laughs> be able to um, easily access and know where to go to get their content. Um, so yeah, we've got a lot of different stuff, um, a lot of content that is basically coming out of China and going to the rest of the world at this point. I, I feel like we're just at the beginning of, um, this work and in the coming years, there's just going to be more and more that we're able to bring out of China. Um, we have two books. I, I have two books that I've worked on for the last year. Um, so not just one, two. <laughs> um, and yeah, the, the first one is it's a collection of sermons preached by house church pastors throughout the year of the pandemic. Um, so it's basically a collection of COVID-19 sermons on things like, death and suffering and our hope in heaven and um, what these mean for this year. Um, it's a, basically a bunch of sermons that we've translated and um, that book will be coming out next year with Lexham Press. And I really love that book. It's it's a very contemplative book. Um, I feel like the preaching that has been taking place in China for the last year is a lot more willing to <laughs> engage with and wrestle with uh, just the darkness of the last year. And um, it's very hopeful at the same time too, though. Um, you know, it's very, the focus is razor sharp on, you know, Christ shines brightly in when the world is very dark. So that's the first book. And the second book, which is very relevant to <laughs> our conversation today, um, I've been working on a book. It's a collection of Wang Yi's writings. And the, the story behind that book is um, he put together a collection of his own writings and then writings from a couple of other um, pretty prominent and important house church pastors up in Beijing. Wang Yi is in Chengdu, which is in the southwest of China. Um, he put together a collection of writings from these different pastors um, several years ago, um, over five years ago, and he called it our house church manifesto. And his church, Early Rain, self-published this book. Um, that book uh, is something that we have basically had access to. Um, it's it's in the public domain. Um, and I have been able to basically add to it significantly um, the writings that he published leading up to his arrest. And so it's basically a lengthy and very chewy um, collection of his theology. Um, and it's, you know, basically his manifesto um, before his arrest. So that is going to be coming out in also next year, most likely um, with university academics. So yeah, we're really excited. I think we, we're looking at having at least one book come out probably every year for the foreseeable future. So we're excited to be working on this. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to it. So definitely let us know when it comes out so that, that I, can, uh, I can post it. Yeah, I will. For sure. <laughs> and also, thank you. I, I realized that I was saying Wang, is it Wang Yi? Wang Yi, yeah. yeah. And so in, in China, the family name comes first. So um, his family name is Wang and his given name is Izzy. So. Okay. Well, perfect. Thank you. Um, so let me kind of explain where where um, we are in, in the season that I'm planning on, on dropping this into to kind of give you some context for for what I'm going to be asking and, and where I'm coming from. And then we'll get right into questions and, and start grilling you. <laughs> um, so we, we are in the middle of a season on nonviolent action. Uh, this podcast is, is largely about nonviolence. And this season in particular is about the way that, that nonviolence has been used throughout history um, to, you know, to change governments or to get rights or, um, just to, to fight back against oppression. And um, 
Yeah, I'm interested in in Wang Yi for for two reasons mainly. Um, one, of, at least in regard to this podcast. <laughs> um, so the big question that we've asked in this season is whether nonviolent action directed at government should be a Christian agenda. Um, I, you know, First Peter is one of the big ones that we've questioned where they're slaves, spouses in difficult marriages, those under oppressive rule. Um, also, we see that in Romans 13, you know, submit to the government. And um, Paul talks about remaining in your position and, and Peter as well. And it doesn't seem like the the trend of the New Testament is that we are to seek getting our rights. It's not a bad thing, right? If, if a slave can be free, be free. But rights aren't really our pursuit. And that's foreign to me as an American because rights are the pursuit of, of life to, to me as an American. Um, but for the New Testament church, it seemed like individual rights and comfort uh, wasn't wasn't the the priority, but rather bearing the testimony of Jesus. And Wang Yi's article it it seemed to show him saying that in his his view that his goal in disobedience isn't to change government, and and that's going to be one of the things that I want to hit on. The other thing that I want to get to is whether the church in China and particularly Wang Yi are are nonviolent because that's not something that that I could really sift out from his work. Now here in the States, we're, we're very much about our rights and, and especially our rights in regard to self-defense. Like my, my group, conservative Christians, we're all about second amendment and self-defense and, and that kind of stuff. And yeah, I'd love to know if there are any conversations with uh, Wang Yi or, or anybody around him as to what self-defense looks like or, or whether that's something they embrace at all or, or not. So that's kind of the context for for what I'm going to be asking. Yeah. Um, all right. All, so all good questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and obviously answer to the best of your ability because yeah, I, yeah. Um, I understand that you're not in direct conversation with with Wang Yi, you know, on a daily basis, or I mean, I don't even know if at all. So the best you can. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, and to be clear, yeah, I am not in direct conversation with Wang Yi. Um, I don't have a prior relationship or friendship with him. I have met him, um, briefly, um, and I've met his wife, but, um, really just in, in passing. So my, I can share um, my understanding of his thought based on having worked with his his material and his written stuff. But yeah, it, it's probably good to be clear that um, I am doing my best to represent him, but <laughs> I am not him. Right. So I, yeah. I, I um, am sharing my analysis and my understanding of what he's talking about. So Okay. Well, we'll take it and it'll be amazing. So, <laughs> so first, first question, um, because I know very little about Wang Yi and, and I imagine that a lot of people listening don't know anything at all. So can you just fill us in who is he and why is he someone that, that the world, uh, at least the Christian world is talking about right now? Yeah, for sure. Um, so Wang Yi is a pastor of um, one of the larger house churches in China. Um, I will say a quick note on what the house church in China is, since um, I think there's still quite a lot of confusion for those who aren't directly involved um, in China on, on what exactly it means when we say a house church. So, um, especially for the last um, decade or two, when we've talked about house church, we're really not necessarily talking about a group of people meeting in a private home, kind of in a, you know, hidden, secretive way. Um, you know, Wang Yi's church, it's called Early Rain uh, Covenant Church. Um, I'll just call it Early Rain. Um, Early Rain had... Um, you know, six to 800 um, members before it was disbanded. And um, they uh, had a very large, uh, basically commercial space that they had turned into a church building. They basically had several floors of a business, uh, like commercial building. 
Um, so, you know, I think often uh, when we hear about house churches in China, we kind of still think about these very small little little hidden family churches. Um, and that really, you there are still those. Um, but for the last 10 to 20 years, um, house churches were allowed to grow quite large. And um, some of them became quite public. Um, basically in 2018, um, new religious regulations were put into place though. And we are currently seeing another shift in the house church. And many of those large house churches are currently breaking down back into smaller groups. So there are still house churches that will meet, um, in rented space, such as like hotel, build, you know, hotel lobbies or hotel rooms or, um, commercial spaces. Um, but there is generally, um, because of increased pressure in the last couple of years, there is a return to more of the small group, um, small meeting model that would have been more common, um, in the last century, (laughs) you could say. Um, Wang Yi, um, he is a really fascinating guy. Um, he's a very brilliant guy. Um, he was uh, a human rights lawyer before he became a Christian. And um, he was kind of uh, already pegged as a you know who's who type person within um, Chinese intellectuals. And um, especially in the... Um, you know, human rights, lawyer, legal world. Um, He um, became a Christian in the early 2000s. And um, pretty immediately after he became a Christian, um, he got involved in ministry and in pastoring. Um, He started helped to start this church started this church early rain and um it grew very quickly as do many churches in china and um i think especially because of his background in law um wangi just has he has a very sharp mind and he's a very sharp thinker and um he really pretty quickly started to engage just a lot of questions regarding the role of the church within society. Um, I think in a lot of ways you could say church state theology. However, um, I think especially after a lot of conversations I've had with those who do know Wang Yi personally, um, I think to kind of relegate his theology and his writing simply to church state is really cutting or selling it short. Um, he, he's thinking a lot more broadly than just the state. He's really thinking about society broadly. He's thinking about, um, the city. He's thinking about, um, eschatology. He's a very eschatological thinker. And, um, all of these things really have come together to form a lot of his responses, um, to the government and especially to the new restrictions that were put into place in 2018. Um, he's, I, I will say he is, um, he is not without critique within the house church. So he can be a controversial figure within the house church. Um, and, and we can get into this, um, more as we work through various questions, but, um, he, I would say he is representative of many house church Christians, but not all <laughs> by any means. Um, and it, I think especially um, there are many within the house church who would like to, in, in a lot of ways, just avoid the whole church state conversation and try to just lay low and not have to have that conversation Wang Yi definitely um, pushes the boundaries on the far other end. <laughs> so um, he is very, you know, he has been very willing to be very vocal, very outspoken. Um, some would accuse him of intentionally picking fights with the government. Um, I don't 
know that that accusation is really warranted. Um, but he he is a very notable figure um, and very probably one of the foremost thinkers um, within Chinese house church Christianity today. I don't know if that if you have kind of uh, specific questions about his bio, I can keep talking, yeah. but I'll stop there. <laughs> so yeah, maybe just just round it out a little bit because um, so that was very helpful. I didn't know that about house churches uh, mm. that that terminology. Yeah, I I just pictured you know maybe fifty max of yeah of no, a house church. Yeah, <clears throat> but yeah, that makes sense that you know understanding what I did about early rain because I was wondering how they had this huge building and yeah. Um, so yeah, very helpful. And I, you also covered my next question because I was going to ask how representative Wang Yi is. And so mm. you said that he probably represents a lot of house church Christians, but may, but not all of them. Uh, yeah, well, so, you know, um, <laughs> China is a very large country, obviously, and Christianity is um, significant within China at this point. So... Um, it's very hard to get an accurate number of Christians within China, but I would say safe estimates are between 70 and 100 million Christians in China today. Um, so as you can imagine, there are, there are, of course, it's a very large group of people. You can find a lot of different, um, traditions, a lot of different streams of thought um, within house church Christianity. And it's probably also, um, it would be good for me to clarify, there is also state-sanctioned Christianity within China. Um, so probably the the most, the, the thing that most unites house church Christianity across China is its unwillingness to submit to the oversight and the authority of the state-sanctioned church. Um, so um, when the communists uh, took over in the middle of the 20th century, um, they did not um, disband all religious practice within China. There is freedom to have religious practice within China, um, however, they did institute um, basically state agencies that um, oversee all of the various um, accepted uh, religions within China. So there is a, um, you know, there is a state sanctioned Christian, Protestant Christian church. There's a state sanctioned Catholic church. There's a state sanctioned Buddhist organization. There's a state sanctioned um Islamic groups. So there's um, the the defining attribute of house churches in China is that they are not willing to submit to this. Uh, this church is called the Three Self Patriotic Movement. And um, but but apart from from kind of that that uniting. Um, uh, principle that you know has created this house church tradition um you really can find a very wide swath of theological um streams of movements and alignments um within that house church so um so i would say wang yi is representative of um a portion of that house church. So if you, if you think of all Christians in China and, and then you make the first division between those who are in the three self church and those who are in the house church, the house church is a larger group than the three self church. Um, but you know, you first kind of do that math and then um, within how the house church, I would say kind of the some of the bigger distinguishing factors are between the rural house church and the urban house church. Um, Wang Yi is very much a part of the urban house church, which um, is very much built from, you know, kind of um, well-educated middle-class Chinese urbanites. Um, and then within, you know, within that group, um, 
you could probably come up with a couple of different streams. Um, one of which, which is growing steadily is, is reformed Christianity. Um, so Wang Yi is, uh, very much, um, interested in and convinced of traditional reformed theology. And so, yeah, so you start, you know, you kind of start to think about all these different pockets and streams. And so, um, and in, even within his very, um, you know, his very particular group of the reformed urban house church, uh, even within that, he's not necessarily, um, I would say he's widely respected, but not everyone would agree with a lot of the actual decisions that he and his church have made regarding the state. So, and maybe as we'll, as we get into things, I'll understand that more, but I guess it's, it's hard for me to comprehend if, if you're in the house church, you've basically said we're, we're in opposition to state oversight. So you've kind of already, you've already kind of set yourself up against the state in, in the sense of like our King is Christ and mm-hmm. we're not going to. So it's, it seems like Wang Yi's position. Um, and again, without, without knowing all the nuance at this point, but it seems like his position would be kind of the majority position because he's <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the group that's against the state. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess I would say, um, this is what I mean by respected. I think um, a, a lot of people would read his um, theological arguments and would agree with probably the theology, but then when it comes to the praxis, they may not agree with a lot of the actual decisions and steps that he and his church okay. took in yeah. applying that theology, if that makes sense. So, okay. Yeah. That, so, and that, that and that gets sense. into things like, you know, um, writing declarations and having house church pastors sign them publicly and, and these types of things. So, yeah. So then maybe draw that out a little bit because, um, you know, what was it that Wang Yi did that, that got him arrested or, or what mm-hmm. are the things that he's doing that kind of set him up maybe sure. more strongly than the other house churches? Yep. Um, so I, I want to be really careful and I, I want to begin, I, I want to f- qualify (laughs) my answer by saying that's a very difficult question to answer. It's very difficult to, um, I would say, give a kind of black or white answer of, you know, this is what happened, this is what he did, and and it it led to his arrest. Um, Just because um, the the systems in China are murky and um, everything is very, everything's just very murky. <laughs> so it can be very hard to, to pick it apart in kind of this very specific way and say, you know, this, this event led to his arrest. Um, that being said, I, I would say that um, Wang Yi, um, Let me back up. I th- I think what you said a moment ago is probably really crucial. So I would say one of the really big questions um, that house churches have been wrestling through, especially um, with the introduction of the new religious regulations in 2018, is really this question of who is the head of the church? Um, so who, you know, who who is the authority? Who is over the church? Who is the head? Um, and um, Wang Yi, you know, he has a very clear, very sharp conviction um, that Christ and only Christ is the head of the church. And that because of that, um, the no submission to the three self church is warranted in any form. Um. He is very um, willing, and he—he, he, I would say, he wants to persuade other house churches of his opinions. <laughs> um, he's very—he um, has been very eager to write um, uh, his thoughts and his convictions in order to kind of shore up and strengthen other house churches and other house church pastors. 
um, regarding this conviction, because I think especially when the new religious regulations came out, um, there were, you know, it, it was the, a significant question of whether a lot of the house churches would at that point start to register with the three self church and um, submit to it. And so, um, especially in the lead up to 2018, um, Wangi was just doing, he was doing a lot of writing, um, and a lot of speaking publicly, um, basically on, on why he thought this should not happen, why he thought house churches, um, should, should remain independent, um, and remain unaffiliated with the three self church. Um, he wrote, um, a couple of pretty important things. Um, the first one is um, he wrote uh, 95 theses um, modeled after Luther's theses. Um, he wrote that and released it in 2017, um, kind of in connection to um, the Reformation 500 anniversaries. Um, he also um, wrote a um, basically a declaration um, about why, just basically saying that you know we as these house churches are are not going to submit to the new religious regulations, and we're not going to submit to um, joining the three self church, and. Um, a lot of house church pastors signed that publicly. Um, we, um, at China partnership, you can find that statement. And, um, I, I don't know what the final count was, but it was at least a, several hundred, um, pastors and elders and leaders who signed that. Um, and then I would say there just were several other things that happened. So early rain every year um, commemorated the 2008 Sichuan earthquake, um, which if you remember that, it was a absolutely devastating earthquake in 2008 and um, hundreds of thousands of deaths. And it revealed a lot of... Um, just institutional corruption within the Chinese government. And um, he, so he and his church um, on the, the um, anniversary of that earthquake would always have a, a basically a memorial service. And um, in, I think it was 2017, or, I'm sorry, no, it was 2018. It was about six months before his um, final arrest. He was arrested um, right before um, that uh, service. And it was a pretty good warning sign that that he, things were going to probably escalate, um, that, um, that he probably at some point was going to be arrested for a, a longer period of time. Um, so I, I would not say that there was kind of any one specific event, but it was really just a slow and steady accumulation of um, his presence. And, you know, he's, he's very well known within China. Um, so he is <laughs> very much a public figure that, um, yeah, so... So maybe one more biographical question, um, and then we'll we'll try to get to maybe more of the the meat of um, praxis and application. Mm -hmm. um, so I I read and you had you had mentioned that he uh, Wang Yi has a an education. He has a background in law, mm -hmm. um, and particularly I think you said human rights. Mm -hmm. um, so I would think that if you know somebody who's steeped in law. And, and government and those sorts of things that he would be wanting to put that education to use to manipulate or maybe manipulates a pejorative word uh, to influence. influence government. Yeah. To, to do good things for Christians. And that's, that's what 
conservative Christians here in particular, well, I guess both sides of Christianity, just, just different, um, you know, goals and avenues, but all Christians in the United States, almost all want to influence government because government is the power that that's going to do good and, and bring us comfort and those sorts of things. So has, how has Wang Yi been influenced by his education in, in coming up with the theology that he has, or has he just kind of put that education to the side? Like what, Mm. how does that play into this whole thing? Mm. Well, um, I think, so I would say first off, um, it's very clear he has a very sharp mind. He is a incredibly intelligent man. Um, I think I would say um, it's very clear that um, his background has just really like he's he's a very clear thinker, <laughs> and I think that really comes from his background. Um, he writes. I was I was talking with someone recently, and we were just talking about how you know reading his theology. It it is it's very um, it reads like reading a lawyer, <laughs> you know, like he's very technical. He, he's very good at making an argument. Um, he's just, he's sharp. I think when I th- think about, um, just kind of who he is and how his background has shaped him, um, it does in some ways remind me a little bit of, of, Luther, and I want to be careful with that. I I don't want to be like, oh, Wang Yi is the next Luther, <laughs> but but I think that you know you look you look at Luther, and it's you can just see how much um, all of his prior training and just the sharpening of his mind um, when he came to Christ and um, his heart was revived. How much just that that mind was kind of set on fire (laughs) to think through a lot of these really big and tricky questions. And I kind of feel like it's similar with Wang Yi in just the sense that he he has a very sharp and active mind. And um, as a Christian and as a pastor, um, he's just basically – you know his he's he is using all of the gifts that he was given um before his conversion and just applying these gifts to these very thorny questions um i would just oh man i hope somehow he is writing (laughs) while he's incarcerated because um yeah he i would I just hope he, I'm sure his mind is staying active and it would be amazing if he's writing throughout all of this. Um, but yeah, he, um, I, I think he, you know, it's, it's, it's probably, we'll probably, we'll just have to start getting into a lot of his theology, but, um, you know, he, he would not say that, um, Christians should not seek to do good in in this world. Um, but his focus is just so clear on um, what that good we're supposed to do in the world is. Um, and so, um, you know, I, and I would also say one of the things that I really like about this book that I've worked on of his writings is that Um, it follows several years, almost a decade of his writings. And you can really see a lot of development in his writings. And so the stuff that he wrote right after he became a Christian is definitely much more um, focused on these kind of questions of rights and the Chinese constitution and the history of the house church and the three self church. And it's, it is much more focused on um, not necessarily advocacy, but um, you know what are the rights and protections of the Chinese house church. And as you know, you follow his writings closer and closer to his arrest. Um, you know, basically, um, I w- I wouldn't say that he stops caring about um, all of those questions. 
But he starts to basically recognize um, that that this eschatological question, where are we going? What are we headed to? What is the end goal and destiny of mankind? Um, that that just dramatically um, alters the questions that we ask regarding rights and the rights of the church. Um, and then, you know, this is getting more into the theology now, but I would say if you look at, if I follow his writings, it, it seems to me that, um, he is thinking more and more like a theologian. Um, that does not mean his legal background is, is fading or, um, going away, but, um, he is definitely a, a engaging these questions less with the primary lens of the law and more with the primary lens of um, our end goal and our end destiny. So I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> so. Yeah, look, look, Let me see if I can summarize it. So I, I might, I know that I have a bias and I want a particular answer. So I want to summarize this <laughs> and you tell me if I'm importing what sure. my thoughts or if I heard you correctly. Okay. So, um, you know, one of the things that that I've come to realize by reading uh, a lot of other people throughout the ages is that, you know, the means and ends kind of kind of go together. So Wang Yi, what it seems like to me is that, you know, at the beginning, he he was trying to um, use the means of government because that's what he kind of knew, and he was a new Christian. Use the means of government to achieve um, the ends, and so if your end is rights. Um, then, uh, or, or laws, then the government is an, an appropriate means to maybe get some of those ends. But as he studied eschatology and, and um, looked at the end goal of Christianity, he realized that the means that get you to God's end, to, to that end, to the eschatological end, are, is the church. And so the government kind of gets put to the wayside, not because they don't do some good things maybe, but because they're not concomitant with the, the uh, ends that we as the church are seeking. Yeah. I, I think that's not, um, yeah, I, I think that's a good summary. I, I would say, you know, he, one of the interesting things to me, reading his works and kind of watching early rain from a distance is, um, uh, to me, sometimes it feels like there are these contradictions um, in the sense that, um, you know, early rain never um, completely disengaged from some of their political advocacy, I would say. So, for example, um, they had a ministry um, taking to take care of and care for basically political dissidents within China. And, and then a lot of that comes from the fact that um, the fa especially the families of political dissidents um, have very few resources. They're, they're, they often basically live in poverty. Um, and I think because of Wang Yi's background, um, he and that church really had a heart to care for the material needs of these people. And I would say they have always been very aware of and mindful of um, just the poor <laughs> and um, those, you know, who are, um, who bear a lot of the brunt of China's um, social struggles and, um, the oppression that that happens there. Um, so, as an American looking at this, I think you know in the U.S. we're so quick to put um, any kind of care for the poor or the marginalized or the oppressed into a certain political stance. Um, and and when you look at um, this church. In China, I, I, it just really doesn't fit into our <laughs> our categories, and I think that's one of the really interesting things to me about it is that um, I would say within China, like what's political and what's not, 
and what's legal and what's not doesn't often fit into our categories the same way. Um, and so I think that's one reason why it's hard to, it's often hard to really, as I said, it's murky and it's hard to give these kind of black and white um, answers on, um, you know, what, what was legal, what was political, what was not um, within early reign in China. So, but I do think that, yes, that, I think that is a very good way to talk about it, that um, I would say the over the course of the years leading up to Wang Yi's arrest and detention in 2018, and I, I just realized, I don't think I really talked about that <laughs> event specifically, but um, he is in jail for nine years. Um, I would say for sure that, question of our eschatology became larger and larger in his mind and loomed larger and larger. And, and that where are we headed to, where are we going has really transformed a lot of his thought and, um, the means by which, um, he, he engages and, um, yeah. And, and I would say that kind of starts to, I think, um, the more he has gone in that direction, the more um, the more people are the more he's approaching these questions from a theological perspective, I think the more uh, and wider his influence on the house church is. So okay. yeah, yeah, I understand that black and white answers are are hard to uh, come up with. And and if you do come up with a black and white answer, it's probably going to be very problematic uh, and and have all (laughs) kinds of implications. Um, But it's, it's good to see someone wrestling, wrestling through that kind of Mm -hmm. stuff. Whereas I I feel like I I'm coming out of a culture that just kind of accepts and, and kind of, um, you know, accept Caesar as Lord um, yeah. in, in a basically equal sense as, as Jesus is Lord. So it's nice to see people wrestle through things. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that, that speaks to governments. I'd also be interested and I don't know if there's as much on this, but maybe you can give me a best guess. Um, what, what does Wang Yi and, and the church in China think about nonviolence? So I imagine that when Wang Yi was arrested, there probably wasn't a thought in his mind or his congregation's mind to fight back against the state mm, mm, for their rights. Mm, mm, is mm. that is that correct? Um, yeah, I, I would say there is um, really not. Well, so I, I would say two things. There is not a conversation within the house church in China about um, forceful defense, (laughs) um, or, you know, physical engagement. Um, they are, they do advocate for themselves. So, and this is also, I think, a you know, a mark of Wang Yi's, um, legal background. Um, there are lawyers that they use to try to, um, you know, go through the system and help themselves. So, uh, you know, they are not opposed to legal advocacy um, within the channels that are presented to them. Um, it's China. So, you know, it's, it's a very, um, it's, it's a, it's not a system <laughs> that is very transparent and um, very easy to navigate. So, um you know, the, I would say the advocacy that they do, um, is it's, you know, there, Wang Yi will remain in jail for nine years. <laughs> He's, you know, they're, they're, I don't know that they're going to advocate him out of there. Um, but nonetheless, they do believe that, um, Christians are, um, able and not just able, but it's good for Christians to advocate in the, within the system as, as they are able to do. Um, so they would not take the role, for example, of a lot of, um, traditional pacifists, um, 
in the West, you know, like the, the Quakers or whatnot, which would, um, you know, basically forego um, kind of legal defenses in that way. So, um, but yeah, there was, I was just looking up, um, there's another organization um, that has translated some s- stuff coming out of China. It's called China Source. And they um, translated an article that he wrote. This was um, uh, something he wrote to his congregation, but it was very widely shared uh, around China. And it's called When the Police Come Knocking, A Guide for Churches. And it's a very lengthy, just basically very lengthy and very specific direction, like list of instructions of, you know, like, when you are interrogated, here are the things that you should do, <laughs> you know, and um, it's you, I think you would find it really interesting. Um, some of the things are, you know, fairly obvious. I think some of them are not, but, you know, you know, he says, under no circumstances lie, don't attempt to play smart and protect the church or others by lying, you know, and I think he gets very detailed in um, what, a Christian should do. And, and again, this is again where his, his um, legal background comes out. Cause he, you know, he's citing like paragraph four of police law, <laughs> you know, article 20, you know, and he's just giving very specific instructions to Christians of, but it is, it is, it is very much from a position of nonviolence um, and a desire to um, submit, but, you know, <laughs> to, um, it's a, I mean, it's basically submissive disobedience, I guess you could call it. So, I mean, and that's what he's, um, pointing to in the declaration that you read a couple weeks ago. Um, but yeah, I'll send you the link for that. It's, it's a really interesting read. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to check that out. And, and it also piqued my interest because we did some episodes on, uh, on lying as well. Mm, mm-hmm. And you know, I'm, I'm seen as crazy because I, I advocate like, well, you should never lie. It's, you know, objectively, it's an objective moral good to tell the truth or, or to be silent. Like you don't have to, you know, uh, betray people, but Mm -hmm. you can be silent. There are other options. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting and people think I'm crazy for that, but like Augustine says the same thing. And it's nice to hear people who are in, in the heat of things who are, are able to, to say that kind of stuff too. So that, yeah, that sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So uh, with, with nonviolence, I mean, you get so many different, different views. I mean, some people say non-resistance, so you don't resist at all. Some people think you shouldn't go through the court system. Some people think, well, we should be nonviolent to political authorities, but not somebody else. Like if, um, if somebody comes and attacks me because I'm a Christian, or Mm -hmm. if somebody comes and attacks me, who's not, a part of the state, then I defend myself. Do you know if if Wangi and the church is is focused just on nonviolence to the state? Yeah, I think that's where I would have to just say I don't know. <laughs> um, everything I've read that touches on nonviolence is is very limited to this question of the church's role with the state. Um, I don't know what they would say, you know, in that type of situation. Um, and yeah, I, I would not want to extrapolate <laughs> and try to come up with answers on that. So, um, okay, um, it's, po- it's possible yeah. they haven't really written about it. Um, it's, it's possible that that has not, um, been kind of systematically thought through at this point. So, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't think you would, but I was, you know, taking the chance. Curious, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, Wang, Wang Yi is, I guess it really depends on, depends on how you define the term protest, because I think people think protests, you, you th- some, some people think rioting, some people think mass demonstration, some people think, you know, just kind of pushing back. Um, Wang Yi's article, the one that I read, and I know several others, are definitely protests in a sense of saying, we protest what what um, the government is doing or, or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, he says that, that his protests 
are are not to change laws or government. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um I, I don't even know exactly what what I want to ask in that regard. What is he protesting? <laughs> Yeah, what is he protesting? But also, how do you how do you delineate between? So, I think the church is supposed to be a prophetic witness. So, even if like I couldn't vote in the last election here in the United States, and um, I've I've come to think that government is very problematic. So, while I wouldn't engage in government, I I think being a prophetic witness to it is what Christians are called to do. I can call them to stop doing injustice. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to go wield the sword against people um, myself. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of, you know, hold their feet to the fire, as we say. Um, so, yeah, wh- where would Wang Yi, as best as you can assess, like, how would he differentiate um, being a prophetic witness and protesting or protesting in an inappropriate manner to seek power? Um, I'm gathering my thoughts. Um, so I would say, uh, well, let me say this. This is, I'm going to share my opinion <laughs> for a moment. Um, cause I actually think it's, it's something I've thought a lot about, um, when, working with Wang Yi's content. I think that um, there is a really kind of um, really fundamental divide um, between how I think about these questions as uh, a 21st century American and how... um, someone in the Chinese house church would think about these questions. And I think that divide is, it really comes down to the fact that um, I live and participate in a democratic system where I believe that my participation has an impact or bears some responsibility. Um, I think in a system like China um, where you are not um, you are not in a democratic system and therefore you're in some sense is always outside the system, if that makes sense. How you think about your responsibility is different because for me, um, I think about voting, I think about influencing the government. And I think like, well, I'm within this system. I'm a part of this system. Um, I think for the Chinese Christian, it's always very clear that that they are not within the system that can affect change. Um, because, And so therefore, um, how you think about the church is a little different, I think, because um, in a sense, the church is free from that question of, um, am I obliged to influence this government somehow? I mean, the question in China is, well, the house church is not going to influence the government politically. It's not even really a question. Um, And so conversations about engagement are always framed from this position of absolute weakness. Um, There is the house church is never going to have power under the current system. And so um, it's kind of not even, that's not even a part of the conversation, I guess, is what I would say is how to have power and then like what to do with that power. So I think when Wang Yi is talking about um, protest or disobedience, um, he's thinking about these things in terms of um, what impact do they have on society around me and not so much what impact do they have on my authorities above me. 
Um, so when he talks about um, protest, um, I would say at this point, especially right before in the year or so before his arrest, um, he's really talking about um, visibly demonstrating to the world around him um, that there is another world that is um, behind everything we see. <laughs> um, and, and his goal is not to um, necessarily affect change on the Chinese Communist Party, um, but it's to testify to anyone who is listening, whether it's within the party or his neighbor next door, um, to the real world and to the spiritual realities that surround us. Um, sometimes I think that, you know, for me in America, um, the fact that I view myself as part of the democratic system that makes decisions, it is a burden and a complication um, that those without any power politically whatsoever um, don't have to deal with, <laughs> you know, um, they they have the privilege of being outsiders and the freedom of being outsiders, whereas I bear a responsibility that I have, find very hard to pick apart. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Uh, yeah, I think I would, I would. Like I appreciate that that perspective, and I I resonate with that. I think I would I would push back on that, um, in just that to tell you a story. Um, when I was at my church a couple of years ago, right around the election, um, they were they were announcing um, that they needed helpers with the food pantry, and I was like, oh, my schedule is busy. I can't do that. You know, nobody like hardly anybody volunteers mm -hmm. for that thing. Mm -hmm. Because everybody's doing something else. It's not their ministry, whatnot. And that's okay. Like, nobody judged me for it. I don't judge anybody else for it. Um, that's just kind of life. But in that election cycle, I was I was contemplating not voting. And when I voiced that, people were like, but you have to vote. Like, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a responsibility. It's a moral responsibility. And it clicked for me that basically my group, we're trying to make the state a savior. Like we have to vote. That's our power. They have, like, they're going to save us type of thing. Like we do good through the state. Whereas when they're saying they need help for a food pantry, we just have silence and crickets mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. what, what good is that going to do to go help and serve people? Mm -hmm. And so I guess with like, I, I really resonate with, with Wang Yi and I, I agree with you. I think in a democracy, we do have this perception that, that, we can we can bring about good but even in a democracy like i resonate a lot with with wang yi because mm -hmm. whereas his state might be a an overt oppressor um i think it's it's similar for us it's just that our state ends up being a false savior for mm -hmm. for our group mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean i mean it doesn't mean that um some people can't do it without idolatry i just yeah, I've mm -hmm. I've seen in the last couple of years how politics um, just takes over. Yeah, well, and I think my my point is is really just that um, we have very different starting points because even your de your decision not to vote is an active decision, right? Um, whereas house church Christians and Wang Yi. Um, and, and that's what I mean by they, they are outside, <laughs> they, are, they are outside the systems of influence in ways we can't, it's hard for us, I think, to even imagine, you know, because who we vote for, whether we vote, um, whether we don't vote, all of those things are, are active decisions that we have, you know, it's our, our, our right to decide to vote or not to vote, you know, um, but when you look at Christians in places who are truly disenfranchised, um, I think that it 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 reframes this conversation in a very significant way, um, and it really reframes um, just the question of 
what what protest is, you know, and and who we're protesting against and why we're protesting and who we're protesting for, you know. Um, and I think that's where for, for Wang Yi, this question of who is the head of the church and where are we going and what is the, um, you know, the destiny of humanity and the destiny of the church. Um, it's just, there's, there's no overlap, (laughs) um, with, you know, a responsibility to the government. I think there is one, there's one, um, thing, there's a, there's a portion of something that he wrote, um, that I have pulled up and if you're okay with it, I'll just read. Cause I think yeah, definitely. Having, having worked with his material, I always go back to this as probably the most important thing for me kind of understanding um, his perspective and where he comes from on this. Um, so this, um, this is from a sermon that he gave. It's called The Cross and the Landfill. And um, this is just basically his summary of this this question of of eschatology and how that influences the decisions that we make in this life. So he says, the church usually has three ways of viewing reality. One view is that the ship is sinking, talking about the world, and thus there is no value in doing anything other than endeavoring to save souls. Another views the ship not as sinking, but as damaged. Regardless of how tattered the ship may be, those who hold this view believe that the power of redemption will uphold the ship and that the kingdom of God will eventually be established on the ship. The third view says that the ship is sinking, but the instruments on the ship must still be cleaned and even used at least once more uh, as in a performance. There will be a brand new ship in the future, but life on the new ship will not be completely unrelated to our life on this currently sinking ship. In a way, our present reality has in fact become meaningless in the light of the gospel. As such, if we were to die immediately, or if time were to instantly come to an end, we would have no regrets. However, in another sense, this meaninglessness Uh, This meaningless reality has become meaningful because of the gospel. We must cherish cherish every second as long as we are still alive and time has not yet come to an end. For it is only through faith that this meaningless reality is connected with eternity. And this is what I think is really important. He says the present reality is an inverted image of eternity. Therefore, our view of reality is of the third kind. The world is a damaged ship and really is sinking. As such, you cannot build the kingdom of heaven on this ship, nor can you treat this ship as your eternal home. But all that is on the ship is an inverted image of eternity, and it is only on this old ship that we can understand the form of the new ship. The key is faith, and faith needs a stage. Faith is like a master ballet dancer dancing gracefully on a dilapidated stage. On the one hand, as long as the dance is beautiful, what does it matter if the stage is in tatters? Alternatively, imagine how glorious and resplendent it will be the day this master dancer performs on a magnificent stage. For now, however, God says that the value of the dance must be expressed on a dilapidated stage. And I think, you know, you can read this and you say, well, what does this have to do with protest? (laughs) Um, But I think... um, This idea that our reality on this side of heaven um, is this inverted image of eternity, that it's this um, dilapidated stage that this play is being enacted out on um, in order to demonstrate the beauty that is coming. Um, It's that's the backdrop for his protest. And that's, that's the lens through which he protests. And, um, so he protests as a testimony to something greater. Um, 
and you know and and i think that's how you square this like i'm not trying to change the government um because this protest is is less focused on um changing laws and changing governments and his protest is really mainly focused on on testifying and testifying to what is true and what is real and um and that's why when they you know all he and all these pastors when they get arrested um they're all like well it's time to go preach the gospel to those who need to hear it you know and um i think that's just where all of their engagement with the state is really focused on this idea of testifying and of testimony. Yeah, I I thought that the analogy of the ballet dancer and the stage was was beautiful, um, mm-hmm. and 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 very powerful to kind of help you see it. It reminds me of, um, you know, there's um, different theodicies for why God allows evil, and and the soul building theodicy is one of those where um, this life kind of prepares us for for the next um, or, you know, this idea of sanctification, which is that, you know, th- this life here isn't worthless just because the world is broken, mm-hmm. but it, it does prepare us. Um, and it, yeah. So I, I think that that's spot on and it just, it, it makes so much sense with us being salt and light and it helps me to see my job as a, as a Christian, you know, is to do the dance is mm-hmm. to, um, exhibit that faith and um yeah and and while i'm dancing across the dilapidated stage i'm probably gonna step on a rusty nail and or something here (laughs) and there Uh, and it's gonna be uncomfortable but um you know do the dance like you said they go to prison they do the dance yeah And, and that brings up one of the things that i know one of the books that you'd mentioned talks about suffering and and i think protest and government and um, nonviolence and all of these things, you can't talk about those things without talking about suffering, you know, going mm-hmm. back to first Peter and um, slaves submitting to their masters. I, that just blows my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, Chinese pastors saying, well, time to go preach the gospel in prison blows mm-hmm. my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Especially as a, as an American Christian who lives in comfort with, with all kinds of rights. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'd love for you to kind of, uh, in in uh, the short time span, I know you wrote a whole uh, got a whole book on it, but can you kind of pull out w- what are some really important things about suffering, why it's it's necessary, how it's helpful? Mm. You know, give us give us a a five minute <laughs> treatise on suffering. Um. Well. Um. Yeah. So this is probably personally in my life been uh, one of the hardest things for me as I engage um, theology coming out of uh, these house churches in China. Um, You know, they will, I have had Chinese pastors say to me, um, you know, just look me in the eyes and say, the Christian life means suffering. And, you know, I think I've been wrestling through that for the last seven years. Um, the first time a Chinese pastor said that to me, it just, I mean, it was just like a visceral reaction within me of like, how can you say that? Like how, you know, as an American, that does not sit well with us. Um, I think that, you know, I, I think it's it's interesting because as I'm working with the theologies of suffering coming out of China, I've also been um, going back and reading um, just some more of our own theology from the West. And, you know, we have we have theologians who talk about suffering, um, but it's not in our um it's not in our like lived church experience. Like it's not what churches talk about, (laughs) you know, like our corporate suffering. So um, what I think the house church really has um, to say to us right now is, you know, basically um, they will just say suffering is part of what it means to be united to Christ. Um, Our Lord and savior who, Um, we believe we are united to through the Holy Spirit. Um, He 
suffered. That was what his life on earth was marked by. Um, and we are not to believe that um, the servant is greater than the master and our master suffered and our master calls us to participate in his suffering with him. And I would say um, kind of what's happening in China is, is this um, theology was very much a, a lived lay theology um, through the very harsh trials of the house church um, through the 20th century, um, last half of the 20th century. And there's a phrase that a lot of pastors use that they say comes from the traditional house church, which is walking the way of the cross and that we walk the way of the cross with Christ. Um, and I think what's happening is that as um, more pastors are being theologically educated, as they're engaging um, the West theology more, um, they're basically just kind of systematizing this theology. And, um, you know, they're, they would basically say, you know, all Christians suffer and not just individually, but we suffer corporately with Christ that the church and the church's identity is to be marked by suffering. Um, and you know, that may look like persecution and may look like, um, hardship under the state. Um, but not necessarily. And, and if it doesn't look like that, then it's something else, you know, maybe, um, there are sins in your life that it will feel like suffering to put to death those sins. Um, Maybe there are um, are relationships that will be, you know, full of suffering in your life. Maybe um, being in a church will be a source of suffering. Um, Maybe um, you will deal with physical, physical suffering in your life, but, um, in all of these things, we are made like Christ and we share in his afflictions um, until we are resurrected in glory with him. Um, I think for me, I, I think, you know, we in the U.S., I think we talk about suffering if we're dealing with physical suffering. I think we're starting to talk about the kind of mental suffering and um, emotional suffering that takes place. But I would still say we don't have a very, um, you know, we, (laughs) I just can't think of many times in, you know, an American church setting that I've maybe ever heard someone just say to me straight up, if you're a Christian, you will suffer. And that is what it means to be a Christian is to suffer with Christ and his afflictions. So, um, well, that, that's a, actually a perfect segue. I, <laughs> I have a question for you. So one of the ways that, that some people are saying that, uh, Christians today are, are suffering in the States and Canada, uh, in particular, or, or being persecuted, you know, the, the whole, um, COVID and masks thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I struggle with this because I, I don't have any any confidence in the state whatsoever. I I don't trust motives. I don't trust actions, that kind of thing. But I I don't know. I also, talking about how we don't suffer in the states ultimately, or we don't bear our crosses really we, um, mo- a lot of the times. A, lo- a lot of the times to kind of justify these things that Christ said, like we will suffer and we will bear our crosses – we have to find suffering and persecution in every every little thing that really isn't suffering and persecution for the name mm. of Christ. Mm. And so we we do have a persecution complex, and it helps me to see that when I I have friends from from around the world, uh, and on Facebook I'll see kind of their reactions to certain things, mm. and it's um, it kind of helps to put things in perspective from a, a global perspective. Mm. So a lot of them, the internationals, think that. We're, we're kind of crazy in the United States. Um, at the same time, there are plenty of close friends and relatives and, and people in my group who really think that the, the masks, um, mask mandates and other sorts of things are suffering and persecution. You know, if a church won't comply with the state mm-hmm. that, um, mm-hmm. 
that that's then persecution. Do you know how Wang Yi might respond to that? Or can you maybe talk about some principles that you can pull out from that, which mm-hmm. might speak to mm-hmm. how to mm-hmm. counsel mm-hmm. Christians who, who think this is persecution, whether it is sure. or not? Yeah. Well, I mean, interestingly, I can, I can tell you that, um, you know, China has gone through a year of pandemic as well. And um, the house churches have been very faithful to comply and to submit with regulations regarding the pandemic. Um, Now, I'm sure there are exceptions somewhere. I don't know every house church (laughs) across China, but I will say in general, um, the house churches in China seek to be very good citizens. Um, they seek to be very faithful citizens um, within China. And I think this is important because um, they are not, I would not say that the house churches are out there looking for things to protest or looking for things to, um, to not submit on. (laughs) If anything, they are trying to submit and be good citizens as far as they possibly can. Um, And I think this is where um, the kind of end goals really come into play because, you know, they are very clear, and I would say Wang Yi is very clear, that Christians are called to be upstanding and good citizens to the far limits that they can until it ex- until it crosses the line of who is in charge of the church and limiting the preaching of the gospel. Um, and until those two things are crossed, you submit to your government. Um, and so, um, you know, I... I don't have Wang Yi's opinion on masks <laughs> or on mask mandates, so I'm not going to, um, you know, put words in his mouth. But I will say that um, they, the house churches, care a lot about being faithful citizens um, within China. And, and I think that, you know, I, I think that... I, I, I was thinking about this question um, before we started talking, and I, and I think kind of one of the things I was thinking about was just, um, as in all things in the Christian life, we we know um, we can we can know if it's spirit filled by whether the fruits of the spirit are produced, <laughs> you know, and I don't think that's any different with um, things like civil disobedience and protesting government decisions. And I think that, you know, I have not studied all of the debates regarding um, church meetings and masking in the U.S. Um, So I would not consider myself an authority on any of these situations. Um, But I think part of what I would say is just – you know, the fruits of the spirit are peace, patience, love, joy, faithfulness, kindness, gentleness. You know, like if if those things are not being produced, um, even in your civil disobedience or in your protest, then I think we have to examine our hearts and we have to examine whether it's a spirit-filled protest or not, <laughs> you know. And I think too, you know, when Chinese house church leaders are arrested. Um, almost all of them, pretty much, I think any testimony I've ever come across from a house church leader, when they talk about their arrest, um, they talk about their own personal repentance um, that that requires. Um, and Wang Yi talks about um persecution of the church in China as a call for the church to repent, not as a call for the government necessarily. I mean, he does say the government needs to repent, but he also says that persecution of the church in China is a time for the church to repent. Um, and I think that, and again, this to me is what are what are the fruits of our civil disobedience? Are, are we producing repentance um, in our protest or are we 
um, producing self-justification, you know. And um, to me, one of the most flooring things working with house church pastors is um, when they talk about their own need to repent of their own idols when they are being arrested and persecuted for being um, a Christian involved with a church. And I I don't see that as a common conversation in the U.S. That's not something. That's not our immediate response. You know, any any hint of oppression or of marginalization, um, we immediately jump to conversations about rights, and we're not quick to talk about what we need to be repenting of ourselves. So, yeah, that, that's so interesting and and so different than the American church um, repenting as they go to prison, that just, that blows my mind. Um, yeah. And, and it remind. sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I can read a testimony from someone about that, but finish your thoughts. So. Yeah. It reminds me just the other day, um, I was, uh, reading a book on, on elders and it, it talked about how, you know, there, there's high qualifications and standards and it quoted first Peter four, where it mm-hmm. says judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Mm-hmm. And it said, you know, you, you recognize that that, like that passage is um, encompassed in this section of Peter, which talks about suffering mm-hmm. and persecution. And I was like, that's, that's weird to think of, you know, when, when I'm being persecuted as an American Christian, like, well, my rights are being infringed upon and all. And that's mm-hmm. true. They mm-hmm. are. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like, to think of it as a time for me to reflect and repent Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. It's just um, amazing. And I I think our, our church could learn from that in a number of issues. I think with, um, you know, with the the masks, racial reconciliation two two big things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I, this is, I um, read this, um, this testimony, um, I, I spoke at the Gospel Coalition Women's Conference in April, and I finished with this testimony. And I think this is just one of the most flooring things I've ever read. <laughs> um, I have met this woman. Um, she is a very dear sister in the Lord. Um, and, you know, I'll set this up just by saying she's, you know, she's very similar to you and me. She's, middle-class Christian, um, has had a very good job in China, um, has been able to send her daughter overseas for her education. Um, you know, so this is, um, someone like you and me and, um, she was arrested and, and I'll just read her testimony. She said, the Lord amazingly helped me put what I learned into practice when I was detained for 30 days. My prayers used to be more centered around my personal needs or the ministries of the church. It was similar in our church. We would pray about different things, but no matter how much we prayed, it did not seem like it helped us grow very much spiritually. During the first three days that I spent at the detention center, I had high hopes that God would deliver me and that that I would be able to leave after a few days. But when I finally received a note that said I would be detained for a month, I made my peace. I saw how Jesus, the word, became flesh and entered into our world, this world of darkness and filth. At first, I really wanted to leave that place because those who were kept there with me were all thieves or drug dealers or prostitutes. But praying the Lord's Prayer helped me recognize who I was and what God's will for me was in that situation. On the third day that I was there, I suddenly understood and surrendered my heart to His Lordship and began to pray every day for the 40-plus cellmates who were there with me. God was so amazing. We were not allowed to share the gospel, but I prayed that His will would be done and that He would bring those that I could share the gospel with to me. Two of my cellmates ended up coming to our church after I was released. As I prayed, forgive my debts as I forgive my debtors. God helped me face my own sins. In particular, He helped me face my idols, the idol of comfort and worldliness and the idol of wanting others' approval. We had little privacy in there. We were often strip searched and we did not have much food and had to sleep on a floor. But God used all of that to deal with my own idolatry. 
As for the police and officers who arrested me, I had a lot of anger toward them at first, but I knew that I had to forgive them. Before I was released, an officer asked me, do you hate the government? At that moment, I really could not feel hate in my heart, and they were amazed by this. While detained, I was especially worried about my church. I thought, this is the end. Our church must be divided now. I have thought there would be no one to lead. Our church must have stopped gathering, and they must have stopped studying the Bible. So I prayed for the church according to the Lord's prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But the most amazing thing happened. During the month of my detention, the church had not stopped worshiping. The reason was that the pastors from other cities had traveled to our city to lead our little church in worship. Moreover, even more churches immediately set up three teams, a pastoral team, a legal team, and a prayer team, in order to support us. That was why I was able to spend my days in detention quite joyfully. It is also why the Lord's Prayer closes with, Amen, because in all things we see God's glory being revealed. My time in detention was really quite all right, and I felt very thankful for that. (laughs) I mean, I read this and it's just mind blowing. I don't know how. um, Yeah, I just, I, I, you know, it's, I think this is a very good snapshot of um, what pastors in the house church in China are striving for, which is basically, you know, when persecution comes, um, use it to preach the gospel, use it to repent of your own sins. And um, and pray that it builds up the church and makes it stronger and not weaker, you know. And I and I just think that's not those are not the immediate reactions of the American church when hardship comes towards us. Yeah, and uh, maybe like you mentioned before, maybe that's um, I, I used to kind of write off eschatology, you know, as mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. as that that future thing that doesn't matter so much, but saying what you just said there and and talking a little bit earlier, it seems like that, that is largely what is guiding um, or or giving the motivation or the the framework for, for them to act like they do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think it's, you know, I, I want to be clear. They are not, um, their focus on, um, eschatology and their focus on um, their end destination um, in the new heavens um, is not making them otherworldly. I think when we um, talk about that in in the West, often because of our our various doctrinal and traditional histories, um, we kind of think like, oh, people who focus on heaven and focus on the end goal um, become otherworldly. And I think um, the f- the Chinese churches focus on evangelism. Also in the U.S., we tend to have this like, well, if you just focus on those people who focus on evangelism, they don't care about doing good. They don't care about justice. And I would just say, you know, <laughs> in all of these things, um, these are churches who are very concerned with reaching um, those who are, um, you know, the least of these in society. They are not, um, they believe, I think that the difference is that they believe that, um, the gospel and, um, eschatology are the things that will primarily make a difference, um, to this broken world, you know, and, um, their focus on these things doesn't make them otherworldly. It makes them very much engaged with their neighborhoods and um, with the, you know, prostitutes and drug dealers who are in jail with them. So, yeah. Well, let me, I, I appreciate you giving me an hour and a half of your time. Um, <laughs> I know that time is very, uh, it is very difficult to come by. So thank you. I just want to close with, with one question and um, give you the last word here. So considering the state of the United States, uh, the, the American church right now, um, and kind of whatever our issues are, you perceive them to be at the moment, um, and knowing what you know about the Chinese church, what would maybe be the, the biggest takeaway that you think we could, we could take from the Chinese church or Wang Yi uh, specifically? Um, I, 
I think the biggest takeaway um, that I would I would have is that um, that the loss of influence and the loss of power does not stop the work of God. Um, that um, we, you know, my belief would be that you know, personally that we are called to use the means that are given to us to, um, be Christ in this world. Um, I also think learning from the Chinese church that, um, <laughs> living with Christ in this world means suffering and it means, um, all sorts of things that go with that. And that's not something we need to fear. It's not something that, um, should cause us anxiety um, because we worship and we serve the ascended Lord who is king over this universe. And if the church in China can grow and thrive the way it has over the last 70 years, um, then I don't think we have anything to fear <laughs> in the U.S. And fear is not what we are called to. Um, I think that one of the things I'm personally just really learning from the house church is that um, suffering and pressure and um, you know persecution, if anything, um, it makes our faith more real, um, and it gives legs to the things that often I think remain theory <laughs> until you have to put them into practice, and so. Um, in the U.S., we talk about forgiving our enemies, but you, I, I don't know what it means to forgive my enemies like my sister in China who has been arrested and been taken to a jail and strip searched and is able to see in her heart that she bears no hatred towards the government, you know? So, you know, for me, in a lot of sense, senses, you know, I don't, I don't want that type of persecution, but I hope that if it were ever to come, that my faith would be made real in the same way that hers is. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you, uh, you giving me a bunch of your time. Yeah, it's fun. And insight.